This nation's entertainment industry is one of the fastest growing creative industries in the world. Its cinematic output routinely ranks in the top five of the most prolific film industries, often outranking the United States. In 2021, it produced 2,500 films, making it the second largest producer of films in the world, a rank it has often held in the last 12 years. What makes it even more remarkable is that this industry only started in the 1990s. And it's not China, South Korea, Canada, or any country in Europe. Welcome to the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast, where only the foolhardy and headstrong dare to venture. For within these humble halls, you may find your heart stirred to join the ranks of a Christian film movement to storm the world with God-glorifying media. But be forewarned, this undertaking will lead you down a perilous road of hardship and scorn. And so, if you're committed to pursue this life of woe, brave soul, I now leave you to your resolute guide, writer and director, Todd Schaefer. What is this country that has this titan film industry? If you haven't guessed, I'll give you another clue. It's a country in Africa. Its industry goes by the moniker of Nollywood, and it's the country of Nigeria. I'm fascinated by the Nigerian film industry. While their films do get knocked for their lack of production value, they have something Hollywood doesn't have. They make relatable films without Hollywood story models, and their films connect to very large audiences. For those of us who have grown up in Hollywood, if we can overlook the clunky craftsmanship, their films can be very refreshing. This is the first in a series of episodes that will focus on the Nigerian film industry. Now, you might be wondering why I think Christian filmmakers need to know about Nigerian cinema. Well, for starters, we're filmmakers. I love cinema. I love cinema history. I love film theory. And I love the cinema of other cultures. And when I find a cinematic culture that challenges the assumptions that are so deeply rooted in Hollywood's creative totalitarian rule, it excites me. And there's something in Nigerian filmmaking culture that better aligns as a model for us who've chosen to be part of this oddity that we call faith-based filmmaking. And I believe, and I could be totally out to lunch here, I believe that if Christian filmmakers spent less time trying to model ourselves after Hollywood and more time modeling ourselves after Nollywood, we would see a faith film revolution. And right now, we're living in a very unique time in cinema history where this could work. My guest today shares my fascination with Nollywood, but he's much more invested. He went to Lagos, Nigeria and made a documentary about the Nigerian film industry. The name of the documentary is Welcome to Nollywood, and the filmmaker is Jamie Meltzer, who also teaches documentary filmmaking at Stanford University. And I hope this podcast encourages you to watch Welcome to Nollywood. It's a fascinating glimpse into this powerful grassroots industry. You'll find links to Welcome to Nollywood and some of Jamie's other works in the show notes of this episode. This is episode 52. I began by asking Jamie, how is it possible that Nigerian filmmakers were able to build an industry that could outrank the film industry in the United States to become the second most prolific film industry in the world? Yeah, and, and definitely just, like in terms of output, you know, yeah. I mean, that's one of the most famous aspects of, of Nollywood is just mm. the amazing um, amount, the amount of output, you know, but also the level of engagement Mm -hmm. um yes so you know how i found out about you know the nollywood industry so this would be have been around 2003 2004 um i was had just finished a, a documentary that i had worked on for a long time maybe five or six years a feature documentary so i was a little frustrated with like first of all how long the the process had had taken me and sort of the limitations of like the indie filmmaking community in terms of funding in terms of the timeline for getting funding and completing a film and then i remember reading in the new york times an article about this nollywood industry which at that time was probably you know 10 years 
in past its like birth um, and um, was just really kind of inspired and, and almost challenged by that industry and sort of looking at it as potentially like a model for filmmaking practice beyond Nollywood, a model mm. for my own filmmaking in some ways. Mm. Um, so I, that, that was a big part of it, just sort of being excited by the fact that there here's this homegrown industry, you know, made with like the tools that are available with uh, digital and video filmmaking tools, which were fairly somewhat new then, you know, um, and definitely new in the context of uh, making feature films um, with um, lower costs, um, digital cameras. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, part of the story kind of comes out of that. It's like Nollywood is an example of what can be accomplished when the tools of industry relative to filmmaking are like democratized. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, once those tools are more widely available, um, you know, people will take advantage of telling their own stories in their own ways. And, you know, that obviously happens in the context of the U.S., but it was exciting to see that happening in the context of another, um, you know, continent and another country because, um, you know, I've traveled around to different film festivals around the world and just in the travels around my travels around the world mm -hmm. in, in general, you know, usually you will see a certain dominance of, of the Hollywood industry worldwide and it has a certain influence so it's always exciting to discover a national cinema that has its own yeah. ways of doing things that are not um that are homegrown that are not mimicking the hollywood models that are creating right. and that are connecting to large audiences because mm -hmm. there's long been a long history of course of filmmaking in africa um but largely those films, let's say from the 60s and 70s and 80s, were playing to more to international audiences and less to home audiences. Oh. So it was like a, more of an elite um, kind of um, practice. It wasn't really connecting with everyday people the way that Nollywood does. And I think that's one thing that's special about Nollywood is it, it's not really at this point it's great you know now in 2022 that nollywood films are available on netflix and can be widely seen um but i think what was more important at the time was that they were connecting with the local audience and that putting that mm -hmm. local audience first yeah um yeah and that local audience is supporting that monstrous industry yeah <clears throat> and to me it's also you know um i would think i'd feel differently about it now in terms of i would sort of question my why am I the person to tell this story kind of like out of Africa, um, you know, like my, you know, at the time, you know, I really didn't have like a deep connection to um, Africa and had been there, um, had traveled a little bit and done some filmmaking in South Africa, but really nothing beyond that. But I was drawn to this idea of a, of a positive story out of Africa, a story of um, you know, a sort of David and Goliath kind of story of, of, of making films at, at um, against all odds in a way, because it's very difficult to make films in, in Lagos in, in particular, you know, you don't have a, as you saw in the film, you know, sometimes it's as simple as just having regular power, you know, and having yeah. that ability to sort of power the lights and power mm -hmm. the machinery that makes films. Um, so the fact that you know these films and this huge film industry was like built almost out of nothing i mean to me that was just a sort of an amazing inspirational mm -hmm. kind of story that again that i thought that um audiences in the u.s and and filmmakers in the u.s could really learn from and be inspired by too yeah i agree because that's the other thing is um not only did the filmmakers you know make in nollywood sort of make build the industry to make films, but they also built the distribution mechanisms. Mm -hmm. so I spent a lot of time in the film or some time in the film, but a lot of time when I was there at these marketplaces where films are actually distributed and sold. And then they go out to like little stores and communities all throughout the country. Right. But they all start from this one marketplace, mm. um, you know, where, where there's a lot of activity. It's a hive of activity of making DVDs and VCDs were, were the format at the time. Um, and um, so that's kind of amazing, not to only um, invent the filmmaking practice, but to also invent the means to market yes. and distribute, you know. But it's now dominated by streaming. 
I believe so. Yeah. I, the last time I was in um, Lagos was I think 2006, maybe even 2005. Um, so a lot of my knowledge of Nollywood is, yeah. you know, more centered around that time frame. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm, you know, still in touch with the film, many of the filmmakers that are in the film and definitely with the main director in the film, Izu Ojukwu. Mm-hmm. And um, I know that, you know, he's continued to work. Um, his you know, work is on Netflix. He's had films at you know, major festivals like Berlin and Toronto International, you know, the best film Mm -hmm. festivals in the world. Um, So he, along with other, you know, Nollywood filmmakers have really kind of um, brought their filmmaking to the larger, you know, film community, even outside Mm -hmm. of um, Nigeria. Um, So it's no longer, it's a homegrown industry, but it's one that has like a much wider, bigger impact now, especially with the access to, you know, streaming platforms. Yeah, I, I wonder if the larger businesses and uh, distributors are coming in now and changing the the dynamic of what's happening there. Yeah, well, I think I, I wonder that too. I mean, what what effect does that have to have a sort of Netflix taking on and distributing the films? And of mm-hmm. course, the, like a, in a positive way, it's a huge um, opportunity for these films to kind of get out to the world and speak to the world. On the other hand, what I really loved about Nollywood was that it was a very clear like representation of yep. of of that this this culture, and it wasn't necessarily like trying to speak to an outside audience. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of power in that, and I, I don't know that that part of it has shifted. But to me, that's like the most powerful <laughs> aspect of it is it's not really making any compromises to these yeah. external audiences. I, I I agree. I mean, when I watched some of the films. Um, I found them really refreshing, not not because I mean, they had the production value and some some creative ways of doing things that, you know, we would look at from Western eyes and go, eh, that's not 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 the greatest. But the stories and the characters were refreshing because they weren't they weren't cookie cutter, you know, this typical formulaic kind of stuff we see coming out of Hollywood where you have to have high concept and certain plot points and this and that. So I, I found that really refreshing. Yeah. Yeah, to me too. That was my my initial draw to it was was really about that. It's like I've always been um, a cinephile, you know, and, you know, I had just come out of grad school for film production and film studies at the time that I made the film. And, um, you know, it's always exciting when you can find a way that someone is making a film that is a completely new way of doing it or a new Mm -hmm. cinematic language. And I think that is what Nollywood, you know, offers. Yeah, and, and um, it's disappointing when you go around the world and you're just seeing the same films that you could see at home. Right. Um, it doesn't seem to expand the palette of like what's possible. It doesn't seem to reflect um, the variety and richness of of different cultures and traditions around the mm-hmm. world. That's very true. Now, were you able to take this model that you'd seen and apply it to your situation? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it was like for me, part of the making of the film came out of, you know, being frustrated with how long it took to make my previous feature film. So going into making this film about Nollywood, I really wanted to kind of um, reflect the way in which they were making films a lot faster, Mm -hmm. a lot more nimble in terms of, um, uh, you know, the, the timeline. Um, and so my idea was to go there and to go there for a summer, because at the time I was teaching um, and still do, but I was um, sort of teaching during the academic year and then I'd have the summers off to work on the filmmaking. Mm-hmm. And so during a summer off between um, academic uh, semesters, I um, thought I could sort of make the whole film, you know, in this in the summer. And, and if they're making a film in Nollywood in 10 days, well, why can't I make one? in 90 days. Um, Of course, I failed miserably. I think it took me, you know, three or four years, maybe three years to make the film from the time that I started filming. Um, But still, that was kind of an inspiration to try Mm. to keep the core themes and passion that I was going for, but not be too, um, you know, but but, but keep it moving um, a little more quickly than I had done before. Um, Mm -hmm. So by limiting myself to those productions that were happening in that particular summer, um, that was like a nice limitation for, for me to have and kept it a little bit less open-ended. Um, mm. 
But basically, yeah, I think the two figures in the film, so to me, it was important to kind of show a diversity of approaches within the Nollywood industry. And so I had on the one hand, Chico Ijiro, who, you know, sort of exemplifies like the, the sort of Nollywood model of like doing things fast, cheap and out of control. And like there was even stories of him where he would make a film um, he would be standing somewhere with a camera face this way and another camera face behind him. And he was basically making two films at the same time. And I don't know oh, if that's wow. like, yes, I remember legend. that. Yep. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's just a, you know, a legend with that sort of speaks to this, to speed and, and prolific nature of his filmmaking. Um, but it does speak to like the core of the, the, the Nollywood story, which is, you know, doing things and getting them out and doing things that are, relevant to the immediate news and culture going on and speaking to that audience as soon as possible. So trying to get things out, you know, yeah. within a few weeks or a month. And then, so that was on the one side, I really wanted to make sure I explored that because I felt like it was something really exciting about that immediacy there. Um, but on the other hand, there was this filmmaker, Izu Ojukwu, that I got to know really well. And his work was much more like considered in terms of the aesthetics and the artistry of it. So he mm -hmm. would take as long as he needed to, to do something. Right. Um, and so he would take many months and sometimes years. Sometimes it takes him many, many years to release a film and mm -hmm. he'll work on it and marinate it in it and like work on the editing process of it um, and just create these really massive, like epic films. Um, some of them like really big in scale and sort of a lot of extras and, historical stories, right. period stories. Um, so he wasn't really bound by that idea of Nollywood as just being this immediate thing. I think he was interested in like raising from his point of view, like the artistry, the cinematography, um, the power of the, the narratives, but, you know, still telling stories that were important um, to, to the culture um, and exploring histories that other people weren't exploring even um, controversial histories of war, mm. et cetera. And, mm. you know, he's even done some, you know, historical epics. Uh, his most recent film, Amina, is about, um, um, you know, a sort of like almost like a warrior princess kind of story um, set. Um, I don't remember the exact era, but it's, you know, a historical epic, mm. um, you know, set in the past in the 16th century. Um, and, um, yeah, so his, I enjoyed that his way of working was different than the expectations that people had of Nollywood. And I think that always reminds us that, you know, the word Nollywood, I think, was just something that was coined by journalists, you know. Yeah. And there's always this this need and this desire to, to label things and box them in. But at the same time that that's happening, there's always people working in other ways that are outside of those boxes. Mm -hmm. And um I just felt really lucky to kind of meet such a, you know, powerful filmmaker who was able to kind of um, nurture and discover his own unique filmmaking voice, you know, from an early yeah. age. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in, in the film, one of my favorite scenes in my, in my documentary is when I um, go with Izu back to his home in Jos, which is in the, mm -hmm. the northern part of Nigeria. And he sort of tells me and shows me how he discovered cinema, which is basically he discovered it through projecting old, you know, Bollywood films from the local theater. And mm -hmm. he constructed his own projector from sort of odd parts that he found um, at a local market. And then he was able to see how frame by frame, how edits were made, how decisions were made in terms of composition. And he was able to study films mm -hmm. in a way that almost harkens back to like the birth of cinema. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that I thought was just really inspiring, first of all, that he could build this machinery of the film projector yeah. from, from scraps. You know, to me, that's like an excellent metaphor for what Nollywood filmmakers were doing with the form <laughs> and the fact that they were working with very little, but making something really, yeah. really beautiful out of it. That's true. Um, what were some of the lessons that you learned from watching these guys and, and understanding how they approach cinema? Obviously, I think one is just to go out and get it done, use the limited, use your limitations and the resources you have. But was there anything else that they they taught you? Well, yeah, I think that's that's a huge lesson that you always have to carry with you as an independent filmmaker, 
everything in the world is kind of conspiring against you. And Mm -hmm. in a way, nobody's interested in your particular vision. You have to have the fortitude and the passion for it and the stubbornness to kind of see it through. So to meet these filmmakers who were doing so much with little resources was just, you know, a kick in the pants, like Mm -hmm. saying, well, there are no excuses for not going out there and realizing your vision. And because the tools of cinema have been democratized, like it's no longer about access to the most resources means you're telling um, the the most important story. I mean, Mm -hmm. a story can be told with little resources. And I think that was like the main carry away that I kind of took from the the Nollywood industry. Um, But yeah, it's like kind of, yeah, a little bit, you know, I mean, it's such a different context. So like, it's a very particular context, Nollywood. And then also the films that I'm making are not fiction films, they're documentaries. So that's also like a completely different approach and a completely different way of even conceiving of cinema and Mm -hmm. storytelling. So there weren't a lot of um, direct kind of storytelling lessons that I learned, but more like how to make the most with your image, how to make a lot with very little, um, how to persevere against adversity um and i think those are like the core lessons that any filmmaker kind of needs Mm. to internalize and understand and combat you know over and over because it's like every film that you make is is a struggle the struggle starts anew you know Mm. yeah that's right so during your travels did you come across any other locales where their film industry was sort of similar to what Nollywood is, but, you know, maybe on a smaller scale. No, but I know Nollywood and I know, I think that's what really attracted me to Nollywood was that it was so unique among mm-hmm. world cinemas mm-hmm. um, because a lot of world cinemas are robust, but they're supported by state institutions. Right. Um, they're <laughs> subsidized. Um, they're made more for an elite and they play more towards like world audiences. Um, Mm -hmm. But like I said, I mean, what was unique about Nollywood is that it was kind of like using these different, this different set of tools um, and not working on celluloid for the most part. And, um, and that it was also not paying attention to the world market. It was really concerned with local stories and the local market. Mm-hmm. Um, so that to me was totally unique and is something that I've seen other cultures and other nations and other national cinemas kind of like take on, you know, I know that almost every country in Africa has a cinema in- industry inspired by Nollywood. Mm-hmm. Um, but I haven't done a lot of travels, you know, to sort of explore that aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Um, Very yeah. interesting. By the way, I think, uh, I read that Chico passed away last year. Yeah, I don't know too much about it, but I heard from a friend, um, yeah, that tragically he did die last year, um, you know, and he was quite young. I don't think he was more than, you know, 50 years old or something. Um, So, yeah, that was really, it was very sad to hear it because I hadn't been in touch with him in a little while. And, um, you know, he was just such a vibrant presence, you know, so passionate about what he did. I mean, he's known, he was known for being prolific and kind of had that kind of legend of just Mm -hmm. making a lot of films but he cared so deeply like when you were on the set with him it wasn't like he didn't care about the quality of what he he was doing he was very engaged um, with his work and um, actually he's the only filmmaker while I was there he took the opportunity to cast me in um, I think it was more of like a TV project that I was working on that oh, I've never cool. seen. Um, but I know that it aired because some people came up to me and told me that they had seen me on TV the next time that I was in Nigeria. Um, so I was actually in one of his films and it was, so it was fun kind of like being on that side of, of um, the filmmaking apparatus and having to act and I have no particular acting skills. So it was difficult, <laughs> but it was a lot of fun to kind of see him in action in that way. So I think, yeah, he was just a person who really um, was so excited about the work that he did. And it's always whatever, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, you know, whatever subject you're, you know, covering or or exploring, like those are the kinds of people who are so exciting to meet because they're so passionate about the particular work that they're doing. And they're so able to articulate that passion and to express Mm -hmm. that passion. And it comes across I think in, in my documentary, like his level of excitement for what he does. Yeah. 
did you find that overall that the filmmakers all had that passion? Was it, is it an easy thing for them to do compared to being in the United States and trying to be an, a filmmaker? No, I think, yeah, it's really hard. I think in, in, in the context of, you know, the Nollywood industry to break mm. into it. Um, you know, so I was at some like casting calls and met a lot of aspiring actors and a lot of aspiring directors while I was there. And, um, there's a lot of hustle involved. I think in that way, it's very similar to other parts of the world where, mm. you know, you're trying to break into this in industry to show your talents and you got to work your way up, you know, you got to work, yeah. um, you know, an apprentice and, you know, sort of like try to mm. get adjacent to the industry and then get into it and then show, you know, your, your talents. But um, yeah, it's a very competitive um, world. Um, and a difficult one because you not only have to make something that's artistic, but to succeed, I think you need um, some commercial success too, you know, so yeah. that's still really important. So it is, it's still a challenging industry. It's not so grassroots maybe anymore. That, you know, some of, some of the filmmakers seem to come from, from, you know, families that were, you know, like maybe they had a brother who was also in filmmaking and then mm. and that's how they got into filmmaking with Izu. I don't, I think he just had a passion for filmmaking you know and he just was like doing it with in whatever way that he could as he was growing up and mm. his talent was just so huge that it was evident to people around him that he was someone to watch and someone to support so um you know some some of the folks seem to have like connections to the industry but i think a lot of people just had talent and like a drive to show show their talent and you know mm. get get hired in whatever yeah. way they could so i guess the uh the the way they would finance films was, was a pretty standard way of raising money. Yeah. Well, I think at the time that I was there in like the early two thousands um, there was a sort of like business class of investors who seemed to mostly be associated with the distribution and the marketing of films. So they would put forward a little bit of money to the creative filmmakers and partner with the filmmakers. And then they would, you know, recoup that money and reinvested in films, you know, but mm. the, the timeline was so much faster. I mean, that what I just described is how private investment, right. you know, works in the US too, but the timeline is, you know, over years, whereas we're talking about a timeline of weeks and months. Mm. Um, and that's probably tied to like why, you know, these sort of structures are tied to like particular facts and like situations on the ground. And I think one reason that it's probably structured that way is that immediacy of the form. The fact that they're getting out film so fast is to kind of recoup that investment like yeah. on a faster timeline. Yeah. So what, what kind of films are you doing now? So, yeah, I'm, I'm a, still, a, I'm a documentary filmmaker, you mm. know, and I also teach documentary filmmaking at Stanford university in oh, an cool. MFA program. So that's a big part of um, mm. my process is just being engaged in like other people's work as well. Um, I've made my most recent films are are a couple of short films. I had a film on the New York Times op docs um, in 2020 oh. um, called Huntsville Station that okay. you can uh, find. I've online. heard of it. And that, that, yeah, that film's about um, it's a short film. It's about 15 minutes long um, and it's about um, a group of um, it's a it's set outside of a prison in Huntsville, Texas. And um, it's really about mm. the people getting released from prison, some of whom have been in for, you know, months and some of them have been in for decades and they get out of prison. Um, we followed them up the street to a bus station. There's a Greyhound bus station up the street from the prison. And then the film really takes place at the station as they wait for their next leg of their journey, mm. you know, and so it finds them in this place where they've just been released. And there's a lot of uncertainty about what their f future will hold. Um, so it's um, kind of a quiet, like almost meditative, like um, film about, you know, possibilities and also about the criminal justice system and it's like kind of failings. Um, and um, yeah, so there, I just did a short film, you know, that that one was released in 2020. And then I just did another one that's on a very different topic that um, is um, hopefully going to be released pretty soon is going to be out South by Southwest this later this week. And oh, that's good. a short called, yeah, not even for a moment do things stand still. It has a long title, <laughs> um, but it's about um, an art installation in Washington, D.C. that honors um, people who have died 
um, from COVID in the US. So the artist, Suzanne Brennan Furstenberg, she set up this field on the National Mall of little white oh, yeah. flags. <laughs> yeah, each one representing someone who died from COVID. And the film really follows people as they dedicate flags so they can fill out a flag for someone that they've lost. Um, usually someone that they weren't a lot, you know, they weren't able to have a funeral for people who have passed. Yeah. And so this art installation kind of serves as a place of remembrance and, and mourning. Um, and so the film is really um, about kind of putting us in touch with the loss that we've all experienced. And of course, some people have experienced, you know, much more dramatically. Um, and it's been hard because, uh, you know, I know across the world, like there's not been that this has just happened. We're in the middle of it in some ways now. And it, I think it's hard to reflect when you're in the middle of something like that on the meaning of it. But I felt like this art installation really provided a place to kind of think about all that has been lost um, and to process like all the trauma that's happened in the last mm -hmm. several years since the start of the mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, so I'm hoping that that'll be more widely released in the next month or so, um, you know, likely on an online outlet. Um, but for right now, it's um, premiering at South by Southwest and then hopefully playing some other festivals this spring and summer. Oh, great. If I could have one more question and then I'll yeah. let you go. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, if you could speak to uh, young people in, who want to do film today and they want to do films that do not necessarily fit the mainstream Hollywood kind of thing. Uh, what kind of advice would you give them as they start their career? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, that that's what's so amazing about the, the world that we live in and the way that things have even been even further democratized in terms of the tool of tools of filmmaking. All the learning is possible, you know, basically online. I mean, mm -hmm. you can you can access so many amazing films. Um, you can access, you know, the editing tools and the tools of 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 capturing content. The cameras are are you know so amazing now um, at, at a pretty low cost. So I think there's not a big barrier for entry. Then I think it comes down to like, what do you have to say? What's unique about what you have to offer, what kinds of new languages of cinema or new ways of storytelling can you kind of come up with in, in ways that we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would like, I would just encourage um, younger filmmakers to kind of steep themselves in the history of kind of cinema and, and what's out there and then, but not to be like, so that they're tied to that, but just so that they have some awareness of the varieties of storytelling that are happening all over the world through cinema um, and use that as like a point of inspiration um, rather than a point of, of being limited by it. That's fantastic advice. Jamie, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's been a privilege to have you on. Yeah, thanks so much for um, showing interest in the film. It was really great to chat with you. In our show notes, you'll find links to Jamie's documentary, Welcome to Nollywood, and some of his other films. Welcome to Nollywood is a treat. If you're a Christian filmmaker, you need to see this film. You will be inspired. And you may come away with an entirely new perspective on what it means to be a filmmaker. In our next episode, we're going to speak with Dr. Elizabeth Oleiwola, who teaches Nigerian film studies at Kwara State University in Nigeria. Her specialty of study is evangelical Nigerian films, which play a far bigger role in the Nigerian film industry than our faith-based movement does in ours. You're not going to want to miss this. Our time together draws to a close, valiant filmmaker. We trust your heart has been warmed and your soul nourished. Your host has been Todd Schaefer, creative director of the faith-based independent production house Glorious Films and animation director at Tonic DNA, where he toils on productions for the major Hollywood establishment. If you wish to support the work of the ministry or simply buy your overworked host a fancy $5 coffee to keep him warm and caffeinated as he pecks out his next script, you can do so on our website at ministryofmotionpictures.org. Again, that's ministryofmotionpictures.org. And you can help spread the word by feeding the algorithms when you share, like, link, follow, subscribe or leave a nasty comment on our social media. Until we see you again, I adjure you, in the name of our Lord, go forth and boldly create 
film. What we do in life echoes in eternity. You're listening to the podcast of the Ministry of Motion Pictures. This is the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast, advancing the art of Christian film.